just putting something up here that will be relevant as my conversation begins. So, welcome. Thank you for having me. My name is Krista Wiley. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of a campaign called Fix Our Schools, um, which started almost exactly four years ago uh, this spring around my dining room table. So thanks so much to the ACO for inviting us here today to speak as part of this symposium. Um, at first, I was a little nervous about actually accepting the invitation because, full disclosure, our perspective as parents has always been one of safe, well-maintained environments in our children's school, and conservation was never really part of our um, part of our vision. So, but the more that I've spoken with with Kathy, I had a great conversation with Alex um, earlier on this week. Um, in listening to Josh this morning, it has become apparent to me that we're not we're not really coming at things from too different a place. If we had taken care of these buildings they would be much easier to preserve and conserve. So we're not too far. Um, so this morning, in my 25 minutes or so, I wanted to cover off just a little bit about what our campaign is all about, how we started, um, a little bit about how it is that we've arrived in a situation in this province where we have almost $16 billion of disrepair in our publicly funded schools. Um, Josh, I, if he's still here, I loved his quote this morning. Um, we're living in a sort of back asswards society if we've allowed this to happen collectively. Where, where two million children in this province, the places in which they spend their days, are in such a state. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Ontario's approach to funding public education, riff a little bit off of uh, what Steve has talked about locally in our uh, Toronto District School Board. Um, quick note that the Toronto District School Board is not the only school board in town. So there's lots of, uh, and I, when people ask me about disrepair, a common question I get is, it, is it related to a neighborhood? Is it somehow in a better neighborhood? Is there less disrepair? And we joke, it's an equal opportunity problem. It is a Catholic, French-speaking, English-speaking problem. So the Toronto Catholic District School Board actually has a much uh, lower stock of schools However, they face a similar, very, the same constraints that the TDSB faces, and their schools have about $660 million of, uh, of disrepair also. And the French and French Catholic boards, if you throw them in the mix, within Toronto, if you count all four school boards, we're looking at close to $5 billion of disrepair. Um, so that's just in Toronto proper. So I want to talk a little bit also about moving forward. Um, a lot of the statistics and facts and stories that I'll share and pictures that I'll share with you today are a little bit doom and gloom and dire. Um, but as parents, we wouldn't have actually started Fix Our Schools had we not had hope that we could affect change. So I want to talk a little bit about moving forward as well. So the first slide that I want to share with you is just what is, what is our campaign all about? Um, we have always, since that first meeting around my dining room table, maintained a nonpartisan approach. We knock on every door, left to right, and anyone who will hear us, we will speak with them and work with them on. Uh, we have always been parents-led, and we became fairly quickly an Ontario-wide campaign. And we have been working for the last four years to ensure that all publicly funded schools in the province are safe, are healthy, are well-maintained buildings, that provide an environment conducive not only for learning but for working. What is a learning environment for two million children in this province is clearly a working environment for many, many, many adults in those buildings. Um, I've already acknowledged openly that our mandate has never been one of conservation, but I feel like my thinking has shifted drastically in the last couple of weeks and I see where these two issues are not too far off and they're very intertwined. So I'm thrilled to have this opportunity today to speak um, with you. And this sort of leads to the title of my presentation was really, can we fix Ontario's schools and conserve them? And I think we, we can. I think anything is possible with enough political pressure and uh, political will. That is what I've come to believe. So our history. Um, history, we started in April 2014. We launched officially in October. Um, our official launch 
uh, synced up with the launch of our website, and we had a logo, and we felt like we were we were something once we had a website. Um, and the the TDSB and the trustees that comprise that board were very obviously excited to have parents on board um, with the issue of disrepair because it's one that had concerned them not only as a board but as staff for many many years. They saw this this train coming that the disrepair was growing and growing and they didn't have the funding to be able to fix it. So they were excited to have us on board and fighting from an objective perspective. So we got a lot of um, we got a lot of introductions to ward council meetings. It was very grassroots. I was out probably two nights a week. Um, we have a small working group. I'm the only one that seems comfortable with public speaking, so I'm the one that talks to the media, and I ended up being the face of Fix Our Schools, but I am certainly just one of many, many parents that is a part of this, uh, part of this group. So I was out probably two nights a week talking to school council meetings, talking to, um, to ward council meetings, and gathering a base of support. Um, and at that point when we started, I think it's important to note that the $143 pencil sharpener, I love that that was the first question out of the gate. Thank you for asking it. Because God, if over the last four years, Fix Our Schools could have come up with something nearly as sticky and memorable as that darn $143 pencil sharpener, we wouldn't have to say again and again and again, it's actually the province that provides all funding for education and schools in this province. We have parents who come to us and say things like, if I had a better principal, our roof would not be leaking. My child would have heat. And I can assure them, no principal in this province, no trustee in this province, is sitting on a blank check that they are withholding because they don't want to fix schools. So the dynamic is so, in some ways it's so simple, but in some ways it's so complex, and there are so many constraints put on school boards um, that it just, I'm happy you asked that question, and I'm happy Steve answered it. Um, but there, I think that that one bit of well-intentioned but somewhat misguided reporting did very little to help us fix our schools because it lent, and surely when we started back in 2014, we came around my dining room table with the belief that this was only a Toronto problem, that the TDSB was highly dysfunctional and inept and inefficient, and that our mandate was to hold everybody involved in school maintenance to account. And we, at that first meeting, estimated it was likely a 50-50% split between school board and province. I would now stand here before you as a parent who's been ridiculously consumed by this issue. I live, um, I live across the street from what was my children's elementary school, and it celebrated its 103rd, sorry, 100th, it's about 103 years old now. So it is, it is charming, it is historical, it is lovely, and that's part of why we actually moved to the neighborhood. I loved the school. Um, but it is falling apart, and it has become an obsession, in part, I think, because it's in my front yard. I see it every day. Um, but when we began, we really did believe this, di this narrative that the TDSB was dysfunctional and highly inefficient with their money. Today, I would stand before you as a parent who's been at this for four years, saying I would lay the blame um, much more in the backyard of the province. Um, I would lay culpability with unions, and I would lay culpability with parents. Um, I'm, I think collectively, we have allowed this to happen. Um, we, as parents, when I drop my child off at school, I want desperately to believe that everything is good. They are good, I pay my taxes, we claim we value education in this province, so I'm not going to scratch the surface too deeply if I hear my grade, uh, my, my youngest is now in grade six, but when he was in grade three, he had been wearing his winter coat in his classroom for two weeks before he even thought to tell me that that was an issue. And what, what sort of sparked him to tell me was a science experiment they had done where they unveiled that uh, his classroom was 12 degrees. So that is crazy to think about what, what was weirder to me was that he hadn't even thought to tell me that that was just normal. Um, so I'm a little bit off track now. I'm going to get back on track. Um, but I, I do think that parents, we have not, um, 
we've not beaten the drum nearly as much as we should have in order to unveil this problem. Um, principals don't want to pull back the veil too much because if you pull back the veil on all of this disrepair that's in a school, you have a very angry community that because they, don't, because they believe the $143 pencil sharpener and that it's really the principal's fault, they'll be at his or her doorstep. So everyone in this, every stakeholder in the dynamic um, seems incented to just keep on trucking in a very Canadian pioneer sort of, we will just get this done, lots of great things go on in these buildings, and it'll be fine, it's just paint peeling. Um, and Kathy, I did, it did not go unnoticed by me that when Steve said they deferred painting, your eyes just sort of opened up. Um, and that's, that is the choice that has been made by school boards across the province. They are not good choices. They are not choices between good and better. They are choices between bad and worse that they've had to make over the last 20 years. Um, so a little bit more about our campaign. We did expand to become a provincial campaign fairly quickly once we realized that disrepair was not unique to Toronto. Um, June 2016, in, in large part, I think, because of the efforts of Fix Our Schools, um, and a lot of our data was corroborated by the Ontario Auditor's General Report in December 2015, um, to substantiate that just based on industry standards alone, $1.4 billion per year ought to have been going to school boards. And when we began, only 150 million was going to school boards for school repair. So picture that scarcity. If you were looking to take care of your house, or an example that I often say, um, or cite is, if I were to give my, my son or daughter $10, and say, you go get our week's worth of groceries for our family of four, does it make any sense at all for me to be disappointed in him or her when they come back short of what I had expected? Um, an average family would spend, I think, about $200 a week on groceries. Um, I give her 10 or 20, she comes back, and she's got about 10 or 20% of what we need. So that's the scarcity that has been dealt to school boards across this province. Uh, so June 2016, the province did come up with a lot more money, which was great. Um, but it's what always ought to have been happening. And so what it failed to address is the $15 billion of disrepair that had accumulated over the 20 years when funding was so chronically and grossly inadequate. So we're now in a situation where we have roughly enough to keep our schools in a state of good repair, but that would suggest that they already are in a state of good repair, and all we have to do is look around here to acknowledge that that's not true. Um, so what we still desperately need from our provincial government are funding solutions and approaches that would address the now $15.9 billion of disrepair that exists. Um, 2016 in August, and this is key as well, because even though the Ministry of Education, as Steve really in great detail outlined for us, even though the Ministry of Education started collecting data, they recognized um, back in 2000, 15 years ago, 2002, 2003, they realized that disrepair was a large and growing problem in our schools. And so that was impetus for them to start collecting data by this third party um, to assess what kind of disrepair was out there. But what they didn't do until August 2016 is make that public. That was secret. So up until August 2016, when the TDSB very courageously stepped forward as the first school board to release the data publicly, um, what, up until that point, even heads of facilities in different school boards had no idea what another school board was facing. So the province was very clever in that holding that information tight to them because information truly is power. If I know that all of my surrounding school boards are facing challenges, I'm a lot more strong as a board than I am if I'm like the TDSB was at the time, thinking, oh, this is, we're dysfunctional. You know, everyone thinks we're dysfunctional. We've got this $143 pencil sharpener. And so we were instrumental in forcing the issue of, um, of transparency as well. So that's been key, sorry, that's been key in allowing us to go forward because data does give us a lot of power. So the next few slides, 
just detail the kind of disrepair that we're looking at. Thanks, Abby. Um, and much of the $15.9 billion of disrepair in the province's schools, it is visible. So we've got things like leaking roofs, we've got broken windows that do get repaired very quickly. That's a little bit dramatic that I've included that there. But um, the, the other two items are much more slow to get, uh, to get fixed. The next picture outlines some more. It, that, it, yeah, first blush, we see the visible. What is not necessarily evident in those photos is what roof leaks then cause wetness that then lead to mold and air quality issues. So the next slide that I've got is actually about the invisible disrepair. And the majority of the $16 billion of disrepair is invisible, so it's harder to capture and see. Those are things like fire suppression alarm system, uh, systems in our kids' schools, um, electrical systems, boilers, structural issues that we won't know are a problem until the point of failure. Um, so those are, in my opinion, even more scary. And another fact that makes this whole thing scary is the $16 billion or 15.9 that I keep, I keep going on about, not included in that number are many, is many things, are many things. Um, the asbestos removal. There's asbestos in a lot of old schools. So asbestos is not included in that number. Uh, wire glass removal not included in that number. Accessibility, we saw Steve mention this, this ramp. Um, and the only reason, I actually noticed that right away when I walked in, because my children's elementary school, there's no elevator, it is entirely inaccessible. And so in this school, they've got elevators, and so then that, you know, the TDSP was thoughtful enough to know that they could make it kind of accessible. Um, so accessibility is not included in that number. Lead in our, in our water is not included in that number. Air quality. And the province's dirty little secret is also portables. So portables are not assessed, right, Steve? Portables are meant to be these temporary structures in which our children learn for a few years until we somehow solve the, I don't know, the space problem. And we all know, I think, as parents, grandparents, community members, once a portable goes on site, it's often there for decades. And those buildings, if you want to call them that, are not assessed. So God only knows what is going on in those. So it's just important to keep in mind that the $16 billion of disrepair that I speak about is just those things that are you know, listed by accruent. Okay, how did we get to $15.9 billion of disrepair in these buildings where our children spend their days. So we go back to 1998, and it came to my attention this week, we could even go back further, but I'm not gonna take us back further than 20 years. Um, but Mike, there was a, a very big shift in how we opted to fund education in this province under the Harris government. Um, they took control over the education funding with an education funding formula. That was another stroke of brilliance by our provincial government. By naming it the funding formula, I think it makes it seem so incredibly opaque, complicated, and inaccessible, and boring, quite frankly, that no media wants to talk about the funding formula, um, that it just becomes this thing that the learned folks at Queen's Park can deal with, and that we can grumble about as, as citizens, but it's harder to access. One of the key challenges, two key challenges actually, with that shift in how we approached funding of education. One is, it seemed that the Harris vision of how we would fund education was sort of a lowest common denominator of what was going on across the province. And it was very focused on the three R's. Things like arts, music, those kind of things were viewed as frills and not necessarily funded to the degree that they ought to have been. So that's one problem. Um, the other almost bigger problem was we believe that there was a confusion between equal, equal funding versus equitable funding. Um, so the example I would give to you, if I'm a parent, I have two children at home, one needs glasses to see, the other has 20-20 vision. What would be equal for me as a parent is to say to my one child, I'm sorry, we're spending X number of dollars on each of you this year, and you're gonna have to go without glasses, so sorry about that. 
Um, what would be equitable, clearly, is if I give both of my children what they need in order to learn and to succeed in life. Um, and unfortunately, the funding formula that still exists today in large part focuses on equal versus delivering what different children, what different schools, what different communities need. I think Steve's, um, Steve's presentation definitely illustrated for us, I can't remember the figure exactly, but Toronto's schools are much older than the average Ontario school. Um, so that's a difference in, in approach. 2002, we have the Rosansky Report, which was commissioned by the uh, Education Minister at the time. It revealed that there was $5.6 billion of disrepair back as far as 15 years ago. We'll flip forward to 2004. The Liberals acknowledged this, a great quote by Gerard Kennedy, ultimately a school's condition uh, reflects the state of commitment of one generation to the advancement of the next. And then we fast forward to 2015, the Auditor General's report that, oh, I'm over. Um, and then we'll flip through, I've only got five minutes left, so we're gonna flip through the next couple to the, um, the next one, there we go. Provincial funding, I think where all of this leads us is that provincial funding has been grossly, chronically inadequate, and it has been unstable. School boards are in a very unlucky position of not knowing, I think Steve, you referred to it as an event when they announce the funding. That's a hard place to be as a homeowner if we don't know what money we have to work with to maintain our home each year. It's hard to make long-term capital plans. Um, we've been working for the last year with the Campaign for Public Education. Um, it allows us a little bit more reach, a lot more resources in order to do the work that we want to do. And one of the things that we did is commission Hugh McKenzie, an economist who's been in education for decades, to write a report for us. Um, and it was, it was released this past November. And according to Hugh McKenzie, financially what is needed in order to truly begin to fix our province's schools is an additional $1.6 billion a year. That's a lot of money. Um, but to not prioritize that, I think is, as a parent, criminal. But as, a, as an, if you're looking at things more pragmatically as a business person or as a, an economist, it's also irresponsible. It's, the longer we let things go, the more expensive the repair is going to be and the less likely that we're going to be able to conserve and preserve these buildings. So can Ontario fix our schools and conserve them? These are the questions I think we need to be able to answer in order for those things to, to be able to be possible. Uh, one is we need a provincial mandate, mandate for both of those things. And currently, there are no standards for good repair. There are no standards really for even health and safety for our children in those buildings. And certainly there is no mandate for conservation that is imposed on or given to school boards. So school boards are not currently incented or rewarded to pay attention to that issue. So we would need that to change. We definitely need adequate, stable funding for both, and that is currently so not true. Um, and we need to ensure accountability and responsibility reside in the same level of government. We've for too long had a dynamic where the power resides up here at the province and in Queen's Park, but they push all responsibility and accountability down to the school boards, which isn't fair, it isn't right, and more importantly, it's not productive. It doesn't make sense. We're not gonna get to solutions by continuing that, uh, that kind of mindset and that kind of dialogue. So moving on, um, what we are doing going forward, um, as Fix Our Schools, we have launched a pledge initiative a few weeks back that we're calling upon people across the province to ask every local MPP candidate to sign a pledge that commits to a standard of good repair, that they would support the development of an Ontario-wide uh, Ontario state of good repair. Um, and almost as importantly, that they would provide the adequate stable funding needed in order to ensure that that standard is met. Um, we brought some, I'd be remiss if I didn't have the opportunity to talk to 100 people today and not bring some of our materials. So Stephen might be handing some things out to you. 
that I believe as, from an ACO perspective, we've got these materials all glossily printed and ready to go. Um, and all you would need to do is layer on the issue of conservation on top, which is very married um, to what we've already laid out in the pledge. So I'd encourage you, because we are in a moment in time, we've got uh, just under nine weeks, where we have the power of our vote, where everybody who knocks on your door, every candidate who attends a local debate, they want your vote. Um, and we are in a situation where this election and the dialogue leading up to it could go any number of ways. Um, we would love to see education and schools be a number one discussion point in the next nine weeks. And everyone in this room can help be a part of that. Um, and certainly the pledge campaign or the pledge initiative that we have launched with the Campaign for Public Education gives you tools um, to do that. So the next, the province holds the power. There we go, we're working, thank you. Next slide. Yeah, to do today. I'd encourage you to check out our website, sign up for our emails, follow us on, um, on social media, because I really do believe that our issues are intertwined. Um, and if we had taken much better care of our schools, they would be much easier to conserve and preserve. Um, and I love, I love the slideshow. Kathy, it's brilliant. It's, it's beautiful. It really is a great... Where's that? Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful reflection of so much... Uh, just, it's so much great, yeah, great building that went on in times before us. And one last thought that I'll leave you with, the new buildings that are being built will not be architecturally significant. They will barely meet, um, they'll barely meet the needs of the community in which they're being built because the way the province funds them is garbage. So they, these buildings are truly, they are worth, uh, worth preserving. So thanks for your time and I'm happy for any questions. Thank you so much, Krista. Um, we've got about five minutes for questions. Um, I'll just go just to the back here. Hi, Krista. I just have a question, I guess, as a member of the public. My understanding is that there have been enormous increases in education funding in Ontario in the last decade and a half, uh, both overall and per student. Um, and you're saying that this is in the context of grossly inadequate funding for infrastructure. Where's the money going and, and why isn't it going to infrastructure? Yeah. Um, I would say full day kindergarten has been a huge spend. So to get elected, it's much sexier and more appealing to the electorate to have a new program than to fix an old building. So I would say um, that, that like, full day kindergarten isn't that alone. Um, and the money that's going into fixing the buildings, Steve, I can't remember the exact phrase you used, but oftentimes it is inefficient because there's so much scarcity that instead of fixing an entire roof and getting it done properly, you patch it. And that, when you add it up, ends up being more expensive than if you just fixed it all at once. But because you didn't have enough money to do it all, you had to do these patchwork jobs. So I would say the money that has gone to, to infrastructure, it's not being efficiently spent, but not because boards are dysfunctional, um, but because there's so much scarcity they're dealing with that they're choosing between bad and worse. And they're, they often embark upon projects almost knowing the futility and how silly it is that they're fixing something um, in a way that isn't really the right way to do it. So that those would be two, two examples for you. Anyone else? Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Mary. I work for Heritage City, Toronto. Uh, I am thrilled to hear that you are um, having conversations with Kathy and others about the importance of preservation and how it's not counter to the sort of goals that you can have because this opposition um, is is a false opposition. Yeah. It's not a fix or a preserve. And I think one of my most unhappy and I have to say disturbing moments in the whole Davisville School issue was that the Toronto Preservation Board 
when, and I'm not sure, and I don't know if it's your group or other groups or just local parents in the school, brought in dozens of children to the preservation board, and they had been told that what we were trying to do to conserve the school was going to deny them essentially their future. And the children were very upset. And they were, had been, to my mind, and I don't mean this meanly, coached in that perspective. Hey, and they genuinely felt that. And I felt so sorry that this generation of little children were being told that to save something that some people thought was important was a barrier to them getting the facilities they needed. And so I think since we're, we think a lot about how we can engage our younger generations in sustainability and, and conservation and education, of course, uh, it's really good that we all get together and figure out how we can support each other and not just, you know, pick at each other in that way because that's about our future children. Right? I couldn't agree more. We had nothing to do. We do not engage at that local level. When parents call us, and want us to engage in that kind of, we, that's not what we're about. Um, and one of our, again, going back to that dining room table meeting four years ago, one of the things that, two things, principal guiding lights of our campaign, um, solution-oriented, collaborative, and child-focused. So um, we couldn't agree more that, and where I started at the beginning of this conversation saying, there is collective culpability for where we are now. Um, as voters, when we choose to focus exclusively on scandal and mudslinging during an election cycle and, and not discuss health and education where our two largest spends are in the province, that's irresponsible of us as citizens, quite frankly. And only when we are solution-oriented, forward-thinking, uh, collaborative, and open-minded, I would say as well, um, solutions that we're willing to entertain range from what would be categorized as very left to very right. But what is not working, and I think the definition of insanity is when you keep doing something again and again and again, and currently the province of Ontario for 20 years has been funding education essentially the same way, and we've gone from 15 years ago there was $5.6 billion of disrepair, today there's triple that. So that's insane. And we need to be open and um, collaborative. I couldn't agree more, Mary. Thanks for bringing that up.